So uh, relational children's ministry probably isn't the most exciting title in the world, but uh, we recognize that in this era, sometimes uh, with all the content that's going around, it just needs to be clean and clear and make sense so that people know exactly what it's about. Uh, for me, uh, I experienced being in the church uh, as a kid. I was about eight years old, and my mom was an atheist feminist, and she was angry at God, angry at people, and uh, brought me to a new school in a small uh, little area and basically needed somebody to watch me after school. And so looking for child care, found a little church across the street, a little Baptist church, and uh, they wanted to reach the community, reach families, uh, reach people in a whole new way, and used their wing uh, from what they used for Sunday school and all their other programs. They, they tried to figure out, is this something that we could do after school, provide an after school program and so on. So my mom walks in, looks at the superintendent, her name was Claire, and says, if you tell my kid about God, church, or Jesus, I'll burn your building down. And Claire, who uh, followed Christ faithfully and understood where people were at because of her own story and background, uh, looked at my mom and said, that's totally fine. Uh, it's a dollar an hour. So is Danny going to be here on Monday or not? And my mom thought, well, how can I turn up a dollar an hour or turn down a dollar an hour? And so that's exactly what happened. She just dove right in and didn't light a match. Uh, within a few months, I became a Christian through this little daycare center. And it was, you know, quite a transformational period, not just for me, uh, because I mean, I was telling my mom about these stories and what was happening, uh, what I was reading in the Bible, the songs we were singing, and that I'd asked Jesus into my heart and all this. And she was just kind of intrigued. And so within a year, she became a Christian. And that started to shape our family in a whole new uh, trajectory. We were baptized together when I was 10, and uh, the rest is sort of history. For me, I recognize that Proverbs 22.6 is really powerful. Train up a child in the way that he or she will go, and when they're old, they won't turn from it. I was on a particular trajectory. God intervened, and then I was on a new trajectory. If I had been growing up and living the way that my mom had been growing up and living, uh, this would be a very different story and a very different interview. As far as uh, her transformation, she started to see some things. Together, we became disciples, but we were being made disciples intentionally by people who were disciple makers. I think there's a big difference between disciples being made passively and making disciples intentionally. So fast forward, I have my own family. I've got a couple sons. They're growing up in the church. They have a much more boring testimony than mine. My wife and I are trying to make sense of uh, what it means to be uh, church leaders. And, and we're, we're finding ourselves uh, frustrated, frustrated with some of the pain points in children's ministry, frustrated with some of the pain points uh, in church life. You know, we don't have enough leaders. We don't have enough money. We don't have... Um, a curriculum that's simple. We don't have, and there was always these we don't have. And we realized that we, like others, had fallen into a trap of the not so great commission. So we know Matthew 28, go and make disciples, but the not so great commission is some adaptation of that that we've created in children's ministry. Go and go and go, make programs, administrate all things, and don't lose any kids. When we get stuck in that rut, we start to remove relationship from the equation. I don't think anybody watching this would disagree that true discipleship is truly relational. True discipleship is truly relational. Disciple making requires the staying power of lasting relationships. Uh, Claire was one of those relationships that God put in our lives so that myself and my mom could see Christ in someone and understand that this was more about people and relationships than it was about the program or the system. I mean, if you want to name your ministry something that will last, name it Oak Tree. The daycare center that I was a part of is still there today. It's been going for 30 plus years. It's a remarkable ministry. And it started because a church decided that they were going to do things differently. So for me, as I've been in pastoral ministry for years and years and years, I read in 2011 a book by David Kinnaman called You Lost Me. 
And as I read it, I was uh, recognizing that I was one of these people. There, there are three categories that they came up with. They, they recognized through their research that there were nomads, prodigals, and exiles. Kids who walk away from the faith uh, either because they're nomads and they just kind of wander from group to group, or they're prodigals, they run away, they, they come back eventually, or they're exiles, they don't feel like they fit. And I couldn't figure out what was it that kept me rooted. And so as I thought about this and I did some research, I realized you almost lost me. And I wasn't trying to point fingers at the church, but it was a reality of you almost lost me. And so for children's ministry leaders who are on this webinar, as you're thinking about kids in your ministry, uh, think about their first names right now. You know, there's there's Austin and Jackie and, you know, these little kids and you're thinking about them walking away from the faith by the time they graduate. The question is, what will keep them? And there's been some good research and some good work done on what is working well. Uh, but this book that I've pulled together, Relational Children's Ministry, it was really a gift from God to be able to offer this story up. Not just my story, but the story of many other people in the book who have basically revolutionized their children's ministry because they've embedded relationship back into the equation. They might not be doing a lot of things uh, extra or more. They might just be doing it differently. They've hit a reset button using these five invitations that Jesus lays out in scripture. As I thought about myself and thought about you almost lost me, what I realized was we need to figure out what will it take to put relationships back into the mix. There's five life-giving invitations that are laid out in the book. Uh, you could find these in the gospel yourself. Uh, chapter four is all about Jesus' disruptive disciple-making approach. And it's really written for your senior pastor to read or your pastor of ministries to read. It's for children's ministry, but it actually lays out the whole model because I believe that if we embed these principles into the church, it will all become a disciple-making community. We all want Proverbs 22, 6 to be true. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't turn from it. But what are we training them up in? Is it the right way? Is it, is it the individualized way as well? Because that verse talks about training up kids in the best way, but it also talks about training them up in the way that they individually are designed. Think about Ephesians 4, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10. And you were created as a masterpiece in Christ Jesus to do good works. What a powerful verse for us to have individually and to receive, and then also to look into the eyes of kids and be able to encourage them as they've been made in God's image equipped and gifted as a full human, a full disciple uh, to go out into ministry. So whether they're an infant all the way up through uh, 18, the truth is, is that we are all children of God. And as we walk in faith and walk in relationship with Christ, we're kids in the kingdom. And the prerequisite for being kids in the kingdom is to have childlike faith, not childish. And a lot of our ministries and programs are very, you know, quirky and goofy and we play games and it's all fun, but we can swing that pendulum too far and actually eliminate either the depth of the gospel or eliminate the depth of relationship in sake of fun and just trying to keep people coming back. So let me offer up to you these five principles. I'll give you a couple uh, reminders and ideas. Uh, and I think that uh, it will help you to embed this to help push the reset button in your ministry so that you you yourself as a kid influencer can become a relational revolutionary, someone who's a disciple maker in your context, who's making disciples of other leaders and other kids. And we'll see uh, quite the revolution uh, in the future and trajectory of faith in our next generation. The first one is that we need to draw kids into an unscripted adventure. As you think about uh, Jesus' words, follow me, over 20 times in the New Testament, he says, follow me, follow me, and people dropped everything. And as you're uh, thinking through your own faith adventure, somebody called you out. They, they called you out and said, please, come with me. I've met Jesus. I've known him, and let's go do what he did. Let's say what he said. Let's teach what he taught. Follow me is as simple as it can be. We're all familiar with follow the leader. We're all familiar with uh, uh, Simon says, you know, but following the leader when it comes to Jesus 
what better leader could we follow? Kids love adventure. They love to know that they're not uh, just doing everything in a pattern and a way. They do like order. They do like systems. But honestly, if you were to say, let's drop everything and go to the park, they would be thrilled. In your children's ministry, remember that it's about follow me. It's about faith over formulas. Uh, a friend of mine, Carl Vaders, wrote a book, Small Church Essentials, and he talks about how we have a, a bias. We have a curriculum bias and we have a, a classroom bias. This is true across the church. We figure if we use this curriculum or we use this classroom, that's the formula. It, it'll work. We take other people's ideas and we implement them, and that's what happens. I would encourage you to coach your leaders to go off script. Uh, there are leaders that you have that need to stick with the curriculum. They don't, they, they're new in the faith. They're not exactly sure what things mean, and you need them to stay on task. But there's other leaders who have been around the block. They've been disciple makers for years. What would it look like to help them to go off script? I had a, a leader one time that I knew for him it was difficult to keep these third grade boys all kind of on track. And he looked at me one day and he said, Dan, this curriculum is just not working. I know where we're supposed to go. I get the point. But can I do it in a different way? And I trusted him because I knew his family. I knew his faith. I was relationally rooted with him. I could trust him. And I knew that fear follows the script. I don't need to be afraid anymore. I can trust that he's going to get us where we need to go. He's going to take those kids where the lesson is leading them, the scriptures that they're using. And it may look very different for his small group than someone else. For us, an unscripted adventure is really how Jesus is inviting us to follow. And I think with kids, we need to be flexible enough that we can help them say, here's the trajectory we're going to, but there's a lot of different ways to get there. It's about walking by faith, not by a formula. The second one is wrestle with messy faith together. Wrestle with messy faith together. The second invitation that Jesus offers up, you hear it in scripture, is sorry, is come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. These words of Jesus are powerful. In my life, my mom was an atheist, feminist. Uh, there was alcohol and drug abuse in the home. There was divorce. And, you know, for us who think that family is just two parents, couple kids, a dog, white picket fence, that, that is so uncommon. <laughs> the truth is, is all of our families are messy. They're relationally messy. They're spiritually messy. We all have history and baggage. Uh, we have a lot of issues on a lot of fronts, financial, educational, and so on. When we don't admit that, there's something about us that becomes uh, not just off-putting, but it's kind of confusing to people who are wrestling with the realities of life. Our kids come with multiple worlds and worldviews. As they come to the ministry that we may offer, they, their way of thinking and their way of life is not the way of the kingdom. So we need to meet them in the mess. For us, it's about relationship over regulations. Yes, we need some rules and some guidelines, and we need to make sure it's safe, and we need to make sure it's fun and all of that. But if we just regulate, Jesus had some pretty strong words for church leaders who did the kind of ministry where they listed off all the rules and all the things to follow and added rules and lists. That was a dangerous game. Jesus says, come to me and my burden will be light. The yoke will be easy. So here's an idea for your ministry. There's three words that I'd love for you to see if you could embed into the, the hearts of your leaders, your teachers, the volunteers, the people that are working with kids. Number one is presence. The power of presence for you to meet with a child or to meet with a parent, eye to eye, heart to heart, that's what lasts. And so presence is communicating in word and deed and in just physically being there, I hear. And wouldn't it be amazing if you heard that through your ministry, through these leaders, I'm here, I'm here. That might mean uh, challenging people to serve more frequently. Yes, of course, they're going to push back. I'm busy. I don't have time. But it's also true that you could call out to them. We're looking for spiritual mentors, kid influencers who are going to provide a consistent environment, and we need you to communicate, I'm here. And so maybe it's every other week. You, you have two people, and they find their own sub because it's either one or the other person. 
as opposed to a once a month round robin rotation. That could create a whole, a whole new set of problems that need to be managed. And we end up missing the making of disciples because we're managing systems and calendars and uh, people's schedules and so on. Second one is humility. Humility communicates, I don't know. If anyone ever asks you about your Bible or some truth of scripture and you uh, immediately start to go, well, I, I, I think I know, or my pastor says, or I read this book. When someone asks you how the Trinity works, it's probably in you to say, oh, it works like ice or water or mist or, or it's like an apple or it's like an egg. And you know, honestly, what if we said, I don't know how the Trinity works. I, I just know that I relate to people uh, like a father and like a brother and like a husband and like a son. I, and God is three in one and he relates to people in different ways, father, son, and Holy Spirit. It's a relational metaphor, but it communicates, I don't know how it works. And it helps people make that connection. Empathy. Empathy communicates, we're in this together. We're in this together. Kids need to know that you are part of this unscripted adventure and this messy faith. We both need to know that we're on the same uh, path. We may be taking different steps. It's sim similar, but it's also true that it's messy. And just to be clear about that, kids know it's messy. Imagine if you were to put up three by five cards in your uh, ministry, have kids write down their prayer request, you would be surprised as to the kinds of things that they're dealing with. My parent had cancer. My uncle uh, lost his job. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that they're facing in the world that are on their hearts that weigh heavy on them. I'm being bullied. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't like myself when I look in the mirror. When you step back as a team and look at those prayer requests, it will change your heart and you will experience a need to step in and be present, to say, I'm here for humility, to say, I don't know all the answers and it's messy. And empathy. Empathy to say, we're in this together. I know what you're feeling. I'm not in your shoes, but I get it. I, my parents were divorced, or I understand what, it like, what it's like to look in the mirror and not like uh, what you see. And we can walk with Jesus together. So unscripted adventure, messy faith. Third one, build unconventional community with families. We have a tendency in the church to point at people who aren't following Jesus the way we think they should and tell them what they should do. Parents look back at us and say, you're the experts. Here's what we think you should do and you should do more. And we have got kids caught in the middle of this finger pointing between the two. It's painful. I'd ask for a show of hands, but I can't see you. But here's the thing. If I was to ask, how many times have you made a side comment about drop-off parents, parents who just show up, drop their kid off and run, and how frustrating that is, and that we want everyone to serve and so on. Fact is, some mom like mine, who's an atheist feminist at the time, who hasn't made a decision to follow Christ, do you really want everyone to serve? fact is, is that parents and families come in all shapes and sizes. They have all different kinds of needs. And if we can remember Jesus' words to love each other and to become interdependent together, as opposed to you do it on your own and we'll do it on our own. Deuteronomy 6, with Moses standing at the mountain, talking about here's what God says as you walk along the road and as you lie down and so on. This wasn't a parents meeting where parents are responsible for all of this. It was the whole family of God in the wilderness trying to figure out for us, what does this mean to be parented by God and to walk by faith? If we're walking along the road, we need to do this as surrogate fathers, brothers, mothers, uh, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins. The body of Christ, the spiritual family came around me. I know that your spiritual family, uh, your church go, comes around kids in your community. We need to create an oasis for children and parents. We need a place where they, they know that they have to show up because it's so important for their life. Maybe you offer a children's ministry uh, program, either on the weekends or in the midweek, and because you're doing that kind of program, parents are in this quandary. Do I take my kid to sports? Do I take my kid to church? Kids don't drive themselves. They may make 
value judgments and prioritize, but it comes down to the parents getting them there. And so for you to start to think through, okay, what do we offer? Is it something that feels extracurricular for parents or is it actually something they deeply need? Maybe it's uh, uh, helping them through uh, weight loss stuff or addictions, uh, dealing with that, dealing with divorce issues, uh, grief support. There could be lots of different ministries that are offered where a parent says, I'm not going to go prioritize that. I'm coming to the church because that family of faith is welcoming me in. I know that was true for me. I know it's true for a lot of you and a lot of the kids in your uh, ministries. There's people that just want to walk beside you, and we need to give them the coaching, the care, and the challenge that they need to succeed, and every family's different. And so instead of saying, hey, everybody has to serve, we need to look at families individually and figure out what would serve them best what would be an oasis that they say, I have to come there and get water from that well? Uh, two more. So after unscripted adventure and messy faith and unconventional community, we need to model life's, Christ's life-transforming mission. Jesus said, I am with you always. It's not just a bunch of good principles and faith-based character counts curriculum that we're offering up to kids. They need to see that our whole lives have been transformed, like that, like that uh, caterpillar turns into a butterfly. It's a complete transformation. And honestly, uh, your leaders, and here's the idea here, connect kids to leaders' lives, not just lanyards. Honestly, not a lot of kids see those leaders with their lanyards outside of church. In fact, you've probably run into people at the grocery store or wherever, and as you've done that, you, you start to realize the kids have no context for what you're, where you're from. Or if they do, the parents don't recognize you. So here's the kid with their little name tag out at the grocery store. They look over, hey, that's Mr. Bill. And the mom looks at Mr. Bill and realizes that Mr. Bill has long hair and he looks like he's on drugs and nobody knows what to do because he seems like the creepy guy over there. But your daughter looks at that guy, Mr. Bill, and says, no, no, that's Mr. Bill from church. And Mr. Bill has been her leader for years, and the parents have not made the connection. And they don't even realize, they just see this guy with a lanyard. Turns out he has quite the remarkable story, and he's not on drugs. He used to be years ago, but he's been transformed. We need to create opportunities for kids to see that leaders have lives outside of leading that little group. For us, it's all about recognizing that this is the power of Christ in Matthew 28, Jesus says, I am with you. I give you all this authority to make disciples. It's the gospel, the power of the gospel, not just good principles that we're living out. And so one way that I've heard that parents, or I'm sorry, that children's ministry leaders do this is sometimes they just do a little follow of some of their leaders. They, they video them going to school and to work or wherever they go when they aren't at church. Uh, they do an interview with them and maybe they highlight it. Uh, up on the big screen if they have screens in their ministry, or maybe they interview them in front of the kids to help kids recognize that these people have a life outside of the, the sitting in the circle with the lanyard around their neck. God is going to do something through you and through the kids that is so much bigger than being part of the ministry in the classrooms or the environment spaces that you meet currently. We need to give people a bigger picture of that, both for the kids but also for the leaders to recognize that their community is much bigger, much stronger, uh, and having a much bigger impact than just the one or two hours on the weekend. The last one is this, equip kids. Jesus' invitation is equip kids for dynamic discipleship. When something is static or something is very predictable, it's just step, 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 go. When you run around a track, you just run around a track. You do it three, four times, then you're done. But our adventure as following Christ, it's unscripted, it's messy, it's unconventional, it's a full life transformation. This is something that's done cross country. Running cross country, cross country takes a whole different set of skills. Jesus wants us to listen to his voice. He says in John 10, 27, my, they're my sheep. I know them. They know me. Listen to my voice. We take that risk. And we need to learn to be dynamic, to know when to turn left and to turn right and to listen to the Holy Spirit like we have headphones on, but also to do that in community, that the community is helping to confirm that. For us, we want to connect those kids. We want to help those kids understand what it means to take steps of faith. 
We want to give them opportunities outside of the church, not just tell them in the church, hey, we should help our parents pick up after dinner or tell our, you know, uh, apologize to your sister or give them all the answers. We need to open it up to let them explore their faith as though they're growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Luke uh, 2.52, that's what we need to have happen because it is that Deuteronomy 6 life where it's not just kids and parents in this mix. It's all of us, the spiritual family, being part of the disciple-making adventure.